I thought we will cover like some of these very typical things uh, which may be popping up as questions in your mind uh, with respect to like, you know, oh, okay, how do I discover these cards? What's going on? And uh, how do I know that something needs to be admitted versus not? Um, those kind of things, we'll look at it in day zero, day one kind of operations, creating a cluster uh, and, and those things. Second uh, so-called, you know, thing that we'll look at is doing the admin activities like, you know, hey, I have users, can it be tied to my LDAP AD or, or can it be, how can I define roles? Since you're doing all these functions, what, what if I don't want access on the network to be given to something uh, which is uh, storage admin, which is different from maybe security admin? And so uh, uh, the RBAC, snapshotting the configuration, we'll look at that. The third piece of the demo is going to be about, um, um, like we'll take one of the functions. I know Sony and Francis talked about multiple of those. We'll take firewall as a function. How do we, how do we go through firewall logs in the, uh, and find out who talked to who? Uh, uh, and, and take a look at the live examples there. Uh, and how could I do the searches on, on my firewall logs or flow logs for that matter? It doesn't have to be always firewall, but any flow that is going through the system. Troubleshooting is a very important aspect. We'll look at you know a uh, little bit of traffic mirroring and wiretap kind of use cases, how to turn those things on and how to turn this device into a, into a tap device, which is always available on, on, on a click. Uh, and we'll look at that. And the last one, uh, you know, which is also very important is operational aspects of monitoring things, auditing what API calls were made. Can I search those APIs? What metrics can I get from, from the system? So uh, right now, um, we'll go with the first part of the demo, which is managing the cluster, looking at the, looking at the cluster as a whole. Uh, this is a system I've logged in. And if it craps out, I have a backup. If that craps out, I have another backup. So please bear with me if it doesn't work out. But at the same time, I, I hope it works out. So on the dashboard, you see that, you know, this cluster is holding 8,000 workloads right now, and there are total 95,000 active sessions. Uh, cluster is made up of three nodes. Francis was talking about, uh, you know, these are like the, the PSM nodes, uh, control plane nodes, if you want to call it. And, and then this has about 910 distributed service cards, which kind of close to 1,000 uh, limit claim that we are making in this, uh, in, in the current, uh, you know, form. Uh, and then yes, of course, you know, it, it gives you the health and various things in the dashboard. It's customizable dashboard. You can do whatever is needed on there. But the system itself consists of a cluster that is consisting of, you know, how many nodes are there. So these are the number of cards I have in the system. These are my control nodes, uh, the status and everything is reported here. What kind of utilization I have, any alerts or events that I've seen on the system. Uh, yeah, yes, there could be critical alerts and all that and events that have happened in the system, if things came up versus down, you can see it from the cluster right here. So it gives you an overall idea of where your cluster is. And DSC, which is a very important part of it, I'm clicking on the second bullet here on the right. Um, so these, um, these DSCs or distributed services cards are really the lifeline of the entire fleet and the infrastructure itself. And it goes through a cycle of like, you know, uh, getting admitted into the cluster to uh, to discovery and all that. So the discovery happens as and when you plug in the server with a card, it will try to talk to mothership uh, based on the coordinates it gets from DHCP, or you could you could uh, you could configure it if that's what you want to. So there are multiple ways to get the Venice coordinates. Um, uh, Venice is a PSM. I'm sorry, I'm still using the internal name, which is why you see that guy rowing the port. That is that's where that uh, that that icon comes from. But but the PSM is going to uh, going to be discovered by the card as it goes and gets its own IP address, and uh, and, and you know I mean we are showing a couple of dashboards on like you know what are the top uh, eight uh, for example uh, distributed cards that are uh, that have the most number of active sessions, and for example this this server supposedly has twenty four thousand sessions currently active on it, and and we can we can manage the lifecycle of the DSC itself right here. So for example, I can go and like click on this to decommission the card or decommission a given server. But if a card is discovered, it'll just show that I've discovered this card, do you want to admit it? You can define policies to admit a given DSC into the cluster uh, and, and pretty much manage what needs to be done. Of course, you know, we'll, we'll go through the upgrades and all those things as well. But, but that roughly is, is like, you know, and then it'll also tell you, by the way, what workloads are running on, on a given server, for example, you know, uh, I'm running all these workloads uh, on, on this particular server uh, and DSC is running XYZ version um, and, and you know whether it's admitted or not, 
various things, which host it belongs to. This is the host uh, that is recognized. Uh, either this could be a Kubernetes node or a vCenter, uh, you know, uh, ESX node, or or maybe just a bare metal node itself. So which host or DSC is associated with? You could have multiple DSCs in a host, and we'll we'll that's why we have that differentiation. Anyway, so I'll I'll stop here for questions. You could you could look at the network interfaces that are present in the system. Uh, for example, if I were to click on, um, um, you know, let me go back to DSC quick and and show you how. You mentioned uh, questions. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Go ahead, Ivan. Uh, so you were talking about Kubernetes and ESX hosts. So yeah. how would those hosts uh, consume your card? Is it a sing it, Does it look like a single Ethernet card with your own driver, or do you emulate some other card, or is it multiple? SRIO VNICs, or how does it look from the server perspective? Yeah, the answer is all of it. Uh, the reason the answer is all of it is because uh, first we can emulate it. we can emulate a card. Of course, uh, if we can emulate a device, PCI device, because of the flexibility that Francis talked about. So clearly, we can we can be a world IO device. That flexibility is built into into the into the hardware already. Nothing to be changed there. But having said that, you know. Um, uh, we do expect we could support up to 2024 virtual functions on the device, and every container VM could get its own VF if that's that's uh, suitable for a given application. Certain V motion cases may not work in case of a SRIOV. So in that case, you know, just we, 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 we it could be just the standard V switch based connecting to those things where we expose ourselves as a dual uh, dual NIC to the uh, to the uplink device. For containers specifically, we are writing a CNI plugin that that will give the ease of integration with the standard upstream Kubernetes. So, so real quick before you go on to the piggyback on what Ivan said or mm -hmm. asked, um, on top of being able to um, function within ESXi or any other Kubernetes or whatever, when you were showing the, actually what you're showing there, the workloads and the hosts and all that, mm -hmm. does, and you may have said this and I missed it, does it actually tell me what that workload is? Does it tell me if it's a VM on vSphere? Is it a... Uh, a pod in Kubernetes, is it whatever? Yes, yes, or, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, it, it does. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll get into the orchestration okay. piece. There is an orchestrator that, that will be associated with- Perfect, that's where I was going workload. next. So awesome. absolutely not just that, we'll also borrow all the tags and, and labels yeah. from Kubernetes and tags from the um, from the vCenter to be able to show it directly right here. Awesome. So all the labels that you see here, these are the labels that are borrowed from, uh, from an orchestrator. Okay. So, so not only that, you know, you get to know the name as is, as it is seen in the orchestration system, but you also get to borrow some of that information to see it here. So you can build workflows and stuff like that based absolutely, on that. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Thank but, you. But this is still DSC level. I'll, I'll get into more details with respect okay. to other things. Uh, one last uh, thing on the DSC itself. If you click on the DSC, um, uh, like for example, I may be able to click on... Um, let me see. So this is a view of a specific distributed services card. You see it is exposing two interfaces up. You can see all the received transmit statistics, what's going on in the card, full visibility into what's what's going on. Besides that, you can see if any alerts were, were happened on, on this particular card or not. Uh, this is the monitoring part that, 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 that we provide uh, to the user to really get a full pulse of what's going on. Uh, if, if, if the DSC is configured to expose 10 VFs or you know, 10 PFs. Then you will, of course, you will see more of those uplinks, and and you can you can you can zoom down to just get a very scanned list of give me the RxCX byte statistics. For example, if you see here, we are we are literally saying that you know this is what is going on in your card. You are you are transmitting these many packets and bytes, and and you are receiving X Y Z. So all that is like you know link wise tied into. Um, so you can swap between DSC. This is still DSC level view. Uh, you could get into the network interfaces themselves. So each one of these one and two in this case is a network interface. You can get, get a list of network interfaces. The main idea behind listing and labeling network interfaces is that you could, for example, when we look at wiretap um, service, you could label these network interfaces and start tapping the traffic for all these network interfaces uh, uh, to be, let's say, for debugging purposes or for, for wiretapping purposes. So, uh, So I think, you know, these are like the fundamentals of the cluster itself. There is a DSC that you can see a cluster of, you know, PSM nodes. You can see DSCs. You can see all the hosts which are discovered. You can see the associated workloads on those hosts. Um, 
and then you know you can see which which workloads are on what host and what's going on in a given DLC, what traffic is being received, what is being transmitted, all that kind of things. Uh, we'll get into API structure very shortly, but I think you know that's roughly the 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 cluster view that you know. Oh, sorry, not this one. Uh, this one, yeah. So the cluster view of like you know how to navigate around this this the scale because you have now thousands of these devices and managing them in a coherent way is is something you could say technically a problem we created but well smart mix are very useful if they could be managed in a coherent way so so we are we are certainly i think you know with our distributed systems uh, sorry distributed services card we could we could get that view of the cluster quick uh, for anyone to see what's going on can we tie all this into my RBAC and my, uh, you know, applications, uh, not applications, my users and roles? And can I take, uh, can, how do I do upgrade snapshots? How do I look at what APIs you guys have? Can I learn all that dynamically? So um, so for that, I think we click on uh, the, the bottom button here. Uh, so I'm going to close the other menu items. So um, of course, yeah, I mean, there is authentication policy that defines, you know, how you are, uh, you know, whether you have local users or LDAP or radius users that you want to integrate with. So we can import all that information from LDAP. Uh, and then, you know, you could assign uh, all those things to which user has what roles uh, completely uh, outside PSM and we can import that information. Uh, clearly, you can add various roles and, and things uh, through, through this, uh, you know, unified uh, uh, system. Uh, but most importantly, you know, you can do system upgrades, and I do want to touch a little bit upon that. Typically, uh, upgrading just the firmware on a card itself is a problem. Now, imagine you know you are doing all this functionality, and you want to upgrade these things. So you can create you know the labels we talked about uh, on various. All objects have a label uh, mechanism. So what you can do is you can label certain DSCs to be production, certain to be tests, certain to be other things. And let's say I I could like create a rollout policy. This is this is what has been done. Uh, in the past, and so uh, I could create a, a rollout policy and say that look, you know, I want to apply it only for uh, you know uh, only for certain uh, DSCs uh, that are uh, that are labeled as you know uh, you know labeled as something which is very specific, and uh, and you could either pr uh, upgrade only DSCs, you could upgrade PSM or both, and and we give that flexibility of upgrading small parts of cluster at a time. Through a unified, you know, uh, policy from from PSM. So this this allows you to effectively, you know, control that that life cycle of of all the software that is being rolled out on various DSCs, which could consist of multiple versions to be running at the same time. And yes, I mean you can schedule those things. You can select the images and all those things up here. Uh, Quick question on that. You said multiple images at the same time. Do you mean on the same DSC or uh, in different in DSCs? Different DSCs. Different. DSCs. Uh, one DSC will have one image, um, and you could you could club a bunch of DSCs together to be calling uh, to be labeled as X Y Z, and and you could upgrade those set of DSCs independent of the other DSCs. Uh, typically, uh, PSM should be just upgraded because it's always backward compatible with uh, with what's going on in the DSCs. So uh, it's always okay to update the PSM to the latest and then migrate where the workloads are running as uh, as the time permits or as you gain more confidence into. Uh, so you're gonna you're gonna move workloads based off of where the DS, DSC is actually located in order to be able to upgrade or or to do to, to move them around for rolling cluster upgrades if that's required, right? So uh, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. We we don't initiate remotion or anything of that sort. If that's what you're referring to, we will we we will allow people to have full control on what gets upgraded when. Um, but at the same time, I think we will not initiate the, the, the migration of the, of the workload itself. Okay. Well, now that you mentioned the word vMotion, mm -hmm. uh, I think pretty much everyone on the delegate panel and probably whoever is watching is interested to know the, amount, uh, the level of compatibility with uh, VMware or vSphere, because we see that it's uh, vSphere 6, 6.5 compatible. But what's the level of it? Yeah, yeah. I think we are working very closely with VMware to, to make sure that it is not just compatible, but also the operational APIs and aspect is is, uh, is held. Um, so, Sony, you want to comment on anything further on on the compatibility itself? From technical point of view, it's perfectly doable. Um, and and uh, 
and you know that's not an issue uh, including uh, vmotion and all that but at the same time i think we want to make sure that the the vr ops and realize uh, you know type of tools that are being used today do not shake up too much or do not shake up at all actually for that matter so you could you could continue using uh, the tooling that that you are familiar with um, and we just try to you know sit under we have right. full driver compatibility as you said with vcs 6.5 and then as vipin uh, alluded to we continue to strive to through the api layer is to drive for the integration into the tools that our customers want us to from an orchestration perspective uh, and vrealize would be one of those tools that we are working with closely with vmware on so in terms of um Compatibility can uh, vSphere based deployment uh, use the full feature set of the card, um, or is there anything that uh, we are still working with? So working we are we're, we're working the details out with working closely with VMware in terms of the baseline of what the biggest value that our customers are deriving day one is of telemetry and visibility. That is of most use if you look at it through the lens of the enterprise. The first phase of deployments. is to work in a heterogeneous environment inclusive of a vSphere environment and the ability to get lot more visibility uh, and uh, ease of troubleshooting that is not available from any infrastructure provider things that this this product can do day one right okay thank you yeah we'll, we'll look at the we'll look at troubleshooting and monitoring aspect like um, but jumping quick into you know i mean of course you can collect and support logs you can you can snapshot the configuration and you can restore them um and these are the previous snapshots so the snapshots are stored on on psm natively you can always export it out uh and there are multiple versions of those that could be available uh, uh you know i mean api is wise uh it's it's whatever you see in the ui is 100% accessible through through the rest uh, interfaces uh it's very easy to learn the api as you so uh, as you as you can see you can look at those api examples but more importantly uh if you see that you know the api structure is very inspired and highly inspired by what kubernetes has and you could have like you know kind meta spec and status into every object and um, and the best part is you can learn it from the live capture so you could literally issue um an api call and i mean you know look at the content for it uh you know based on what was received and sent and for example in this case i could see like okay this is what this is what a cluster object looks like so it's a uh, it's it's a tool just to make sure that automation teams can be super uh, you know friendly and and knowing uh, what's going on when they issue certain calls and apis of course there's a live documentation uh, I mean, there's also documentation built into this um if you click on you know if you click on the documentation um Uh, link here but those are like you know the administrative operations uh that i was hoping to quickly touch upon um if not maybe you know um three more quick uh things um from the from the various services i'm touching upon firewall as a use case of course this is we can we can do everything uh or rather demo everything in the, in this time period but i'll touch upon quickly on how a uh, firewall implementation could look like so i'll, I'll click on security here and you know define let's say in a in a simple case a very uh, a very elaborate i would say uh, uh it looks like there are 2500 uh, rules but some of these policies some of these rules are uh, are actually more of aggregate rules um so you could have comma separated multi uh, ip address based label based rules uh, with multiple ports in each one of them and of course you can search an ip and say hey tell me which rule is going to satisfy uh uh you know and and that is always a question is there a policy that includes uh you know that that will permit this particular ip for example to anyone for that matter and uh and i could you know i could do a search and i could say look you know all these policies are going to permit this traffic now which destination is it wanting to talk to you can look at it and what port it is of course you can punch in the destination too if you have but if you don't know you can still like look at rule number 70 is going to allow this traffic to to be permitted towards this port and all that so while security policy is defined uh, uh it, it it is like say you know it could do uh, hundreds of thousands of rules really um and each rule is really a multi you know multi uh 
uh, multi workload based rules. So you could have a subnet, a range of subnets, a comma separated subnets, or you could define rules like how how Kubernetes defines, which is based on a network uh, network policy based on labels. So you could define rules based on labels, and and you could get there. One of the important aspect of firewall is to be able to capture everything that that uh, that went through a firewall. For example, show me what happened. And so the system's up and running for quite some time. And I'm showing 8,000 rules out of 98 million that that have been collected over over the period of time since we have the system up and running. Um, but I think you know uh, it's very powerful to start seeing all the connection logs right here. Um, and and not only that, you could search those things as well and say that hey, you know, tell me who all, for example, you know, uh, a given uh, node ever talked to. Uh, uh, for, for what you know. Um, and, you know, I could just pick a source and it says, well, there are 1,106 entries where this particular IP, uh, you know, tried to talk to or, 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 or you know, to anyone. And so um, it could be filtered based on actions, could be filtered based on protocols, based on, uh, based on anything. And, and not only that, it'll also, it'll also suggest that, by the way, which policy allowed it uh, or denied it for, 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 for that matter. So, so I think this is uh, very basics of you know defining a firewall policy based on uh, based on you know applications and based on application content itself. So you can define predefined apps, and you could have a set of uh, applications that could be like uh, representing say Mongo or, or Oracle applications in your in your infrastructure. And this is where I think there was a question from from John or someone that you know. Do you go beyond beyond layer four? And yes, I think this is where we'll start showing the application based on the content. So instead of instead of giving an application which is defined based on protocol or ports, you could say that hey, I don't care what port protocol it is as long as it's talking Mongo, I want to permit it. And so, um, so can the, I go back to uh, layer three for a second? I'm seeing all IPv4 stuff is v6 baked in here. V6 is baked in. Um, uh, it's it's not available right now, but it is baked in, um, and we'll we'll we'll, work, we'll get it released soon. Uh, and this firewall is effectively running on the NIC, right? Yes, so from the absolutely. server perspective, it's exactly the same as having Eccles on the switchboard with a slightly bigger TCAM. Uh, not really. It's more than Eccles. Eccles may be stateless. This is a hundred percent stateful connection tracking, uh, you know, a firewall. So we know exactly, in fact, we could go beyond that, what Francis was alluding to, we could actually uh, determine, um, you know, if there are any, uh, if there are any um, aberrations in the TCP sequence numbers that is happening in the, uh, on the wire or not. So uh, I think there was a comment made uh, earlier also that, you know, so we have put a switch into the card. Actually, we have put all the services into the card. So switch is a very basic part of it. But yes, you know, it's all stateful. So same thing with load balancing. It will be stateful load balancing. So it always, a given flow will always go to a given backend uh, and, and all that. Uh, but uh, while you can check the sanity of sequence numbers, you probably can't do defragmentation or reassembly, right? We could, uh, well, if you are terminating a TCP connection, we can do segmentation reassembly as well in the pipeline. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so that's like that's how features will show up in PSM from manageability point of view. Of course, the, I, I'm I'm logged in right now. If you look at it, my my you know my credentials right now is admin, and admin has all the privileges, which is why I'm seeing network and security and and everything here. But if I'm if I don't have privileges, the menu will cut short, and you will only see the 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 objects to which you have access to. Um, and of course, the SDN part gets defined into the network, uh, which uh, which which we could look at as well. Uh, but in the interest of time, um, you know, I want to quickly let's see how much time do I have? Maybe ten more minutes. Yeah. Um, so I want to go over uh, two more things, uh, and and you know, but if there are any questions on the firewall, happy to entertain them now. You can define applications. You can define rules. Rules based on IPs, labels. Yep. You got a quick question. I got a quick question. Do you have a different policy framework for being able to do NFE? So if you're trying to actually follow where things are going, obviously the security policy is just a portion of that, but do you have mm -hmm. something that's doing that or is that all network on the software defined side? 
um, if you can elaborate the question, do you mean to say that if you can detect that, you know, it's the same thing which went through this uh, NFE device and went out, but the subscriber is exactly the same as it was before, is that what you're alluding to? Well, or even just a way to be able to sign, to be able to prove that a particular flow went through all the right devices, right? So it went through my firewall, went through my load balancer, actually terminated yeah. on the right yeah. TLS device. How are you actually thinking about or managing that? Or are you pushing that to another third party system and saying the yeah. capabilities are in the platform, but we don't provide that native? Yeah, no, it's a very good question. And I think the answer to that is going beyond layer four, obviously, because when you are determining what's going on between two connections that are stitched together, then those the only way you can relate that, you can correlate these two is based on the content which is going on inside that. And if a VNF is not altering layer seven data, then it could be inferred based on that. So examining the content of a connection is a certain way to do that. And we are doing, you know, we, we, are, we are looking at that. Um, I wish, you know, that was ready for the demo, but I think, you know, but yes, I think you know it's 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 something we we have uh, working. So yeah, that I mean, would be a way to say that you know, I, I know that the Open NFE is proposing things like that are similar, to like inband OEM, right, where you can you can be able to sign the flows through each sequence, and since you guys can do that, you know, with mm -hmm. P4 within the chip, you can sign every single sequence that everything is going through. Is there a way to actually follow through for for oh, what happens? Yeah, yeah, that, this flow. No, that's a that's a good point. We didn't look at that part, but it, that is easier way to do what you're talking about. Even if you don't have any correlation based on the data, we could do more correlation um, for between two connections and, uh, and and look at that. But but yeah, I think you know we are we are trying to attack the second one first as opposed to uh, you know the the open NFE standard based approach um, because uh, we think that it is applicable for for NFE as well as opposed to the other. Vipin, real quick, and I know yeah. you're trying to rush through. Um, obviously, from a service chaining perspective, I can do that all within the card, but can I do any sort of, or is there any benefit at all to actually doing uh, using these cards as a service chain in a service chain from other network components or anything like that? Um, you are suggesting that the card itself is used for service chaining rather than uh, rather than for the services offered to NFV functions. Is that correct? I'm I'm just thinking out loud. I, real more than anything, no, no, I'm just thinking. I mean, yeah, if, yeah, we yeah. Are, if we are offering, we think that NFV should NFV appliances should definitely leverage all this functionality. Right. Uh, we cannot and don't want to replace everyone. By the way, that's not the goal. The main sure. idea is that you know, uh, spend CPU cycles, spend your energy and and those things on, on more value because you're given certain amount of CPU and memory, leverage it for those things instead of trying to do some basic stuff like layer four, layer seven parsing maybe, you know. Maybe you want to do a lot more intelligent stuff with that information that is given to you. So we think we, that we are like augmenting, uh, augmenting that space quite nicely. Yep. Uh, but if it is doing basic stuff and routing and tunneling and all that, absolutely we can, we can do that. I'm just thinking from from just thinking like from an ACI perspective, if I can tap into this card, if there's any benefit or anything like that. But you know, just trying to see is what potential is there. Yeah, one of the use cases you can think about is that uh, if you look at the ACI today, you know, all these services are provided by different appliances, right? And that can be replaced by this device. You don't even have to go to the PCI. You can just have packet in, packet out, and provide all these services. Right from the card. From the yeah. card. Yep. And that's where I was going with that, really. Yes. So Absolutely. Thank you. Larry, yeah. that's yeah. a good choice. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, in transit, in transit device to, to augment what Prem is saying, and, and there are use cases where we don't need to be sending it to the PCI at all. We could be, when we augment those NFE devices, we could be in an RPS. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Vipin, let's uh, move to the troubleshooting section because I yeah. think that is the most uh, customer pertinent part that we have left only six minutes for. Yeah, yeah, Sony. Thank I, you. I, that's why I'm, I'm, that's the next one. So uh, in troubleshooting, I mean, you know, uh, we are sitting in the in line with respect to what's going uh, what's going through the card, and one of the use cases that we have run into quite often is that you know uh, I want to mirror all my traffic, uh, you know, going to a given workload or going to a given card on a link or pretty much send me everything because I don't know what's going on. So mirroring is, is a good answer uh, to that. At the same time, there's difference between the mirroring done in, the, in, in what we have versus typically uh, that you have seen on, on the switches. Uh, uh, 
largely because uh, we can guarantee this for bi-directional at the same time running on all the traffic. And that's a big deal for many who are interested in not losing any of the mirror traffic because they are relying on that to be used for a variety of use cases. So, um, so we can ensure that, you know, uh, we will always uh, mirror the traffic in both directions simultaneously for any flow. And, and for that, I think, you know, you could create mirror sessions. You could specify the type of export and where the collectors are. There could be multiple of the collectors. And for every packet, you could generate maybe four copies or eight copies out, sorry, four copies out. And there could be eight sessions going on simultaneously in, in each device, uh, giving you plenty of ways to analyze this information outside. So, uh, you know, all you need is to make sure 100 gig bandwidth is honored total, uh, you know, once we, once we get to that. And with that, I think you could, uh, you could use this very powerful feature uh, to be getting this, you know, guaranteed uh, packet mirroring on, on anything that's flowing through the system. Uh, it's as easy as selecting, uh, let's say you, you can specify the rules, like, hey, I want to do it based on certain labels or workloads or, or Mac or IP addresses, or I could say that, you know what, uh, I want to select all, uh, you know, uh, all interfaces that are labeled as uh, blah, 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 whatever, you know, whatever that you want to label as. We looked at various interfaces, so you can select what interfaces you want to capture, and these interfaces could be facing workloads or facing uplinks, going to top of rack. It could also help you answer this age-old question, which is that, you know, is it a network problem or is it a, you know, application problem? And you could, we are sitting right, right at the, uh, you know, boundary point where we could, you know, give that information through, uh, through the captured, uh, through this, through this feature. Uh, pretty good tool for troubleshooting. Um, any questions on that, but there are other tools like flow export. You could do net flow export from this IP fix export. I mean, uh, to know what's going on. We do collect the flow information, but maybe, you know, IP fix gives you an additional level of RX, DX bytes that are going through a given long lived flow, for example. Um, and so perfectly okay to have a similar policy defined for flow export as well. Um, and that includes not just the RX, DX bytes, but, but what kind of, you know, retransmissions could have happened on a given flow or what I mean, TCP retransmissions, for example, or, you know, what kind of drops have been seen uh, for a given, uh, for a given flow. Those kind of things are additional values that we could decorate and then send it out to, to a recipient. Um, one last part, which is equally important is uh, monitoring and auditing and metrics and all that. So, um, of course, I mean, system has a uh, has an array of alerts uh, and events that are collected. You could export, you could uh, you could export all the audit logs and, and alerts and events into into an external system, and you can create those you know archivals uh, which will be saved in the system that you can uh, boot off of. Uh, audit events will capture every single API call that has been made into the system, and of course, uh, only a user that has a permission to look at the audit logs will will have access to that. Um, so, you know, what happened, when it happened, who was the client, um, and which, you know, which node it was, it was received on which service, uh, kind of took it. Um, and this could be like, you know, export, uh, export it out if, if that is needed through, um, through the export, um, you know, tooling. Um, the, the last part of, of monitoring is really, you know, metrics. We are sitting in the path. We are collecting plenty of data. And it could be, you know, could be present. This is live, so uh, that's why a few of the charts at the below are not showing anything. But uh, but you could c create custom charts and uh, uh, and say that you know what metrics you are interested in versus uh, versus not. And uh, and so you could say that look, I want to create a uh, you know custom chart for uh, looking at maybe drop statistics and CPS statistics. Uh, uh, you know, or, or if I'm clicking drop, then you can select various kinds of drops that you're interested in. Uh, maybe, you know, hardware errors, maybe you want to look at TCP reset with invalid uh, acts and drops. Uh, let me refresh this. Um, yeah, so, uh, sorry, we were on the create chart, I'm sorry. So, yeah, so you could actually, you know, uh, start to look at what drops you are interested in looking at uh, malform packets or various things. Uh, and then, you know, um, create your own custom dashboards who will continue to add more and more metrics into it. 
Um, but, uh, you know, but maybe, you know, you could, Yeah, I think there's no data on, on these kind of metrics right now, but but that's what that's what you will you will do. It could be group based on various things. You can name it as whatever you want, and then uh, you can hit the click uh, on on create, and that should do it. Um, so, but then you know um, uh, you could select you know everything where where all you want to collect. You don't have to collect metrics from everyone. Maybe you want to collect a specific or a set of servers or a specific server if that's what you're interested in. So it shows up all the bare metal nodes that that are discovered here, um, and and you can group them based on whatever whatever is needed. 